see. <laughs> we'll talk about it later on. Yeah, so uh, I just want to wrap up 2.3 and 2.4 with some important concepts that we need to know. And then, time permitting, we'll talk about some derivative properties and formulas that we can use as shortcuts to compute derivatives, because we don't want to use the limit definition our whole lives. Um, but before that, let's just... So last time, we spoke about the second derivative on concavity, so let's just recall some things. I hope this can show up. The problem with colored chalk is it's hard to erase. Anyway, let's just recall some important facts that we know so far. Um, we know of a function that we call f prime of x. This function is defined to be the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. This function is called the derivative of f at x. What it does is it gives you the slope of the function at x. Um, you can also think of this as the slope of the tangent line. You can also think of this as the rate of change of the function. Right, so it's a measure of how fast the function is changing at a certain point. Um, it's also a measure for the slope of the tangent line. The important thing with the tangent line is that it's used as an approximation for our function. So sometimes if we're dealing with really crazy functions and they're just really tough to work with, we would instead work with the tangent lines of the function because straight lines are very easy to work with. We know everything about straight lines since way back in algebra class. Um, so uh, tangent lines are used as approximations to functions at a certain point. The idea is you're drawing a straight line to a function in such a way that if you zoom in, the function and the straight line look pretty much the same. Um, and so that's what a tangent line is, and this is the function that gives you the slope of such a line at the point. Um, and because the slope is, again, we can interpret it as a rate of change, it, 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 it is equivalent to saying it's the rate of change of the function at a certain point. So that was the derivative. Um, we then spoke about the second <coughs> derivative. This guy is based as the name suggests it's the derivative of the derivative. So basically all the things that the derivative does with the function f, the second derivative does with the derivative function. So it's the slope of the slope. So now you're not only measuring how the rate, the rate of change of a function, you're measuring how the rate itself is changing over time. Um, this leads to things like, um, talks about the concavity of the function. which you can think of as a way, a description of how the rate of the change is changing. So whether it's bulging in or it's bulging out, um, that can mean something different. This means it's increasing, but the rate at which it's increasing is actually increasing also. And, and this guy is increasing, but the rate at which it's increasing is decreasing. Right? So concavity can give you another dimension on top of this guy. And so that's the second derivative. Um, we have various notations for this, just let, let's make sure we're all on the same page. So f prime of x, or f prime, or y prime, if I'm using y equals f of x, or dy dx, or something like d dx, of, and I can write the function beside it. These all mean the same thing. This is the first derivative. First derivative of f. Um, notation for the second derivative is very similar. You just put two notches, that's f double prime. You can say y double prime, you can say d squared y dx squared, or you can say something like d squared dx squared of the function. That gives us the second derivative. So these are all notations. Prime notations are attributed to Newton. And the 
Um, differential notations are d d attributed to Leibniz. Um, two guys who are accredited with um, developing modern calculus as we know it independently. Okay. So this is what we know so far. We know about a function called derivative, uh, de defined using this limit. We've used that limit to compute the derivatives of several functions. These are some interpretations we can put on this. And the interpretation, of course, will mean different things in different contexts. It depends on what your original function f of x is measuring. Then you can put this interpretation on top of that. Similarly, with the second derivative, you can put this interpretation on top of a function as measuring how its rate is changing over time. And that can, of course, help you with predictions um, in the future um, in ways we were discussing. So that's kind of where we were. I want to continue our discussion of derivatives with some more important concepts. In particular, um, you might have noticed that the derivative is a limit. And as we've studied in limits, it's possible for limits to not exist. So in the same way, it's possible for derivatives to not exist. Um, so the whole point of why we're here is to talk about derivatives. That's more than half the point of why we're here. Um, so it, it might seem to you that the derivative is all powerful. Sorry. Did you finish? It was a hiccup. Oh, was it? I thought you were saying, oh, I, I thought you were trying to stop me from erasing. Okay. I was like, oh. something like you're like, hey. Oh. Very confrontational hiccup. Okay. Um, but it's possible for derivatives to not exist, and sometimes we need to know when these situations arise. So if we're examining a function at some point, and we want to use calculus to talk about things, there are times when we can't do that. Um, so let's talk about that. Um, so let's examine when the derivative does not exist. Um, so the idea is the derivative is a limit. There are three situations in which the derivative will not exist. I'm going to describe all of them to you, but first we're going to do an example to illustrate why this might be something that come up. I'm going to talk about a very simple function. It's a function that you guys should be familiar with, and we're going to try to find a derivative at a certain point of this function, and it's just it's not going to work. Um, so even fairly uh, simple-looking functions can mess up a derivative at a certain point. absolute value of x. At x equals zero. So this is going to be our, our segue into um, talking about when the derivative does not exist. So we know the derivative is this guy. means the derivative at 0 just means I plug in x equals 0 to this function. It'll be easier to deal with plugging in the number first with the absolute value because it's kind of a weird function. Um, so let's actually continue. So if my function is absolute value of x, what is f of 0 plus h? <coughs> hmm? Well, no, it's absolute value of x, these bars here. Mm -hmm. So you do define f of 0 plus h. Absolute value of 0 plus h. You just replace all x's with 
whatever is in the parentheses. Okay, so this is minus absolute value of zero over h. And uh, what's absolute value of zero? Zero. Well, that's just zero, so that's we can ignore that guy. And so what we end up with is the limit <coughs> as h approaches zero of the absolute value of h over h. Now, what is that limit? What do you remember about the absolute value function? Do you guys remember how it's defined? What it looks like? Looks like a v. Looks like a v. So our absolute value function looks like a v, like that. So what's the definition on this side? On the long hmm? It's y equals x, right? That's just a straight line y equals x. What about this line on this side? It's y equals minus x. So the absolute value of x is a piecewise function. It always seeks to make a function positive because it's supposed to describe the distance from the origin. And so it, there are two possibilities. It gives you x if your x is positive, meaning if your x is already positive, it's not going to do anything. The output will just be that number. Um, but it gives you minus x if x is negative. So if your x is over here, right, if you're, you have negative x's, it will make them positive by taking the negative of the negatives, right? So you get that guy. So the absolute value of function actually splits into two pieces, where it, ha it has a sign change on each piece depending on what the sign of the input value is. So when you get to here, and you're approaching zero, notice that that's right here smack dab in the middle. There's a problem whether we're approaching zero from the left or the right. We're looking at different functions, essentially. And so this guy actually breaks into two parts. It's the limit as h approaches zero of h over h whenever your h is positive. But it's the limit as h approaches zero of minus h over h whenever your h is negative. This guy, of course, simplifies to one. The limit ends up being one. Whereas this guy cancels and simplifies to minus one. So the limit here ends up being minus 1, which makes sense. The slope of this line is 1, and the slope of that line is minus 1. So it makes sense that the slopes um, end up being those numbers. But the important thing is, this is basically the limit as we're approaching from the right, and that's basically the limit as we're approaching from the left. And what do we know if the left and right don't agree? The overall limit does not exist. <coughs> So the derivative of the absolute value of x at x equals 0 is given by this limit. But that limit does not exist. It means the derivative does not exist. So it turns out at this function, which is a relatively simple function, you guys have all seen it before, um, it's impossible to take a derivative at a certain point. Why do you think that was? Because it changes like infinitesimal, infinitesimally close to the limit. So you need certain points. You need more than one point to judge it. Uh, kind of. Maybe you could say that. That's true, but that's not really why. The idea is at this point, you need to remember what the derivative does. The derivative gives you the slope of the tangent line at the point. So. I can ask you, is it possible to draw a tangent line at that point? No. Is there any straight line that I can draw at that point that if I zoom in, the straight line and the point would look pretty much the same? The answer is no. A sharp corner will never look like a line, no matter how much you zoom in. So that's essentially the answer. A derivative will not exist at a point of a function if we can't draw a tangent line at that point. And basically, we know we can't do that is if when we zoom in, we can, it, it won't look like a straight line. Uh, this is because
even if you go with the naive definition of a tangent line, that it should only touch a curve locally at one point, which strictly speaking is not true, but for a lot of nice functions it is. If you want to think of drawing a straight line through this point, that will only touch that, that function at that one point, it turns out that there are tons of lines that you can draw, and none of them are better than the other one if you zoom in far enough to the point. Like, there, there's no defined tangent line. Like, these are all good approximations for that point, in that they're bad approximations for that point. Right? If you zoom into a sharp corner, it never flattens out to a straight line. Um, so there's no valid tangent line to draw here. And so, i.e., we can't take derivatives if we can't draw tangent lines. Derivative, the whole point of the derivative is to give us the slope of the tangent line. If no such line exists, the derivative cannot exist. Um, so I'm going to. There are really three situations in which this can happen, and I'm going to describe them for you soon. But I just wanted to look up, uh, define a, a phrase for you here. If f cannot. differentiated, meaning we cannot find a derivative at a point, it is said to not be differentiable, is the objective we would use to <coughs> find derivatives. So it's not differentiable. Right? Whereas if we can find a, func a derivative, we say the function is differentiable at the point. So now let me describe the three situations. First case is the case similar to absolute value of x. Sharp corners. Sharp corners are bad. You'll never be able to find a derivative at a sharp corner. Um, the mathematical way of saying sharp corner is cusp. That's a, the geometrical term. Cusp just means sharp corner. There's no possible to wait to draw a tangent line to a sharp corner. A sharp corner is, is not approximately linear. If you zoom in, it doesn't look like a straight line. Therefore, no straight line can really approximate a sharp corner. So sharp corners are bad, and absolute value of x has one at x equals 0. Um, where else can we not draw a tangent line? If it's discontinuous. If a function is not continuous, it is not differentiable. You can draw a tangent line to a point if the point doesn't exist in the first place. So discon discontinuity happens, remember, when we have like a hole or a gap or a jump. There are no points to draw lines to. So they don't have tangent lines. So you can have something like that, or a jump, or something like an asymptote. So we're not differentiable. Here, or here, or along the x side of that line. Because right? there's no point to draw a tangent line to. You 
can't find the equation of a line if we don't have a point. So sharp corners are bad. The point might exist. The function is defined there, but we can't take a derivative. But if there is no point, like there's a gap or a hole or a jump, we can't find a derivative either. There's one third case. Um, it's kind of a weird case. Like these two aren't that weird, sharp corners and, and gaps show up all the time. But the third case is is very weird. It's it's, it's when a function sort of borderlines on not being a function. Um, the third case is at a point where there is a vertical. So there are sometimes functions might exhibit some weird behavior. They might do something like have an inflection point such that for a split second at the inflection point, they're vertical. Now, they can't do this for more than a single point. Um, but it turns out they can do it in such a way that the best tangent line is just a vertical one going straight through the point. So if our tangent is vertical, This means the slope is undefined, right? For vertical length, slope is undefined. But that means the derivative is undefined because the derivative is the slope. So anytime there's a problem with slope, there's a problem with derivative. There's not much to test here. We're mostly going to be concerned with applications of derivatives. So when derivatives do work, we want to do stuff with them. Um, but if I test you on something like this, it'll be a graphical question. So let me kind of give you an example of that. Can I erase this? Here would be an example of a question where I can test if you, you understand this idea. Um, state all x values Continuous. That's A. B. F of X is not differential. And then I give you a graph, and you're just going to look at the picture, and you're going to point out all the parts where it's not continuous or it's not differential. function f of x with the domain of f, just consider it to be all numbers greater than 0.
Okay, so something like that. I give you a picture of a function, a graph. It's obviously a piecewise <coughs> graph. It's a horizontal line between 0 and 2. There's a semicircle between 2 and 6. A straight line here, and then that graph there. Um, For what x values is f not continuous? 10 and 12, right? It's not continuous here because there's a jump, right? So this whole time I was starting, I could draw the graph without lifting my pencil off the page. It was very continuous, moving along. I get to this point and then suddenly I have to make a jump. That's not continuous. Also at 12, I have to make a jump to go over that asymptote. So there are two x values which is not continuous. x equals 10 and x equals 12. So whether there's a break in the graph, a jump, a gap of some sort, it's not continuous there. It's continuous everywhere else. Um, let's say f is not differentiable. That. All the x values? 2, 6, 10, 12. Okay. So at 2, um, we're not differentiable because that's a sharp corner. It comes in as a straight line and then branches off as a semicircle, so that's a sharp corner. There's no way to draw a nice tangent line there. Um, and so 2 is actually bad. Again, at 6, we have the same situation happening. There's a sharp corner here, a sharp turn. So x equals 6. And then these guys, x equals 10 and x equals 12. By the way, those guys are automatic. These are guys you don't even have to think about because once you're not continuous, you're automatically not differentiable. And so we, will, we can just realize that. So any answer here would be an answer here. So something like that. You should be able to look at a graph and be able to tell um, where you can find tangent lines, where calculus will work, where calculus will not work. Not a major focus, but I'll, I will test you on it at some point. Um, we're more focused with when derivatives do work and what we can do with them. But be aware that it's not all sunshine and roses. Things can go wrong. Calculus can break down at certain points. And it breaks down at points like that. And this is really the, the, the thing that we're going to kind of end this section with, I think. Yeah. So really to summarize a lot of what we've been talking about so far um, into one big summary. So now let's talk about the kinds of functions we, we've seen so far and what they can tell us. So it's nice to kind of have that in your head. So later on we'll, we'll be doing a bunch of things with derivatives. You'll kind of see why it does certain things or why I would tell you to do certain things is because you're understanding the goal of what you're looking for. Um, so let's talk about let's get our function here. So I'm gonna, we're going to do a big table. We're going to kind of summarize the information that we've had so far. Similar to the table that you did in, in, in the quiz, but we're, we're going to fill it in a lot more. So there's a function, what it tells us. There. And how it tells us. So not only are we going to know what kind of information we can get from certain functions, how do we extract that information from the functions? So the first is some random function that you're given, <coughs> f of x. We know a lot about functions so far, um, so we, we kind of know what this guy tells us. 
this tells us about the outputs for some rule. You give me a rule that when you give me when I give you an input, it outputs exactly one thing. Um, the function will tell me what that output is. In other words, graphically speaking, it gives you the points on a graph. How does it tell us? Well, the, the idea is basically you plug in x and compute y equals f of x. And if y equals f of x, right, I mean when you plug in x, the output is y, then that means the coordinate x comma y is on the graph. So this is how we're going to use functions. They're going to tell us about outputs for certain rules that we want to establish. Um, and when we're graphing them, the original function will tell us about the points that we can obtain on that graph. So for example, in a problem, if I'm asking, find the equation of the tangent line. You know the tangent line is a straight line. You need a slope and a point. How do you get the point? You look at the original function. You will never look at any other function to, if you want to find the points on a graph. You always look at the original function to find the points on a graph. All right, so that should roughly be familiar to us all. We've been dealing with functions for a long time. But now here's some new functions that we're talking about. f prime, the first derivative. Now this is a function that we can derive from, pardon the pun, derive from another function, um, f of x, in cases where it's possible, in cases that we can draw a tangent line. And that gives us certain information. The information that the derivative gives us is it tells us if f is increasing, Meaning, is our function going up as you move from left to right? It can tell us if f is decreasing. If it's going down from left to right, or whatever quantity we're measuring is getting bigger or smaller, that's what the derivative will tell us. It can also tell us about maximums and minimums. Right? So remember, for a quadratic things were easy. We can find the maximums or the minimums by just using the vertex formula. In general, there is no vertex formula. There's no formula for finding the maximum of a random function. We can use calculus to calculate that. So whenever we need to find a maximum or a minimum, we can use derivatives. If we need to figure out if a function is increasing or decreasing, we can use derivatives. If I want to figure out the point on a graph, I do not use the derivative. A derivative is not to figure out the point on a graph. Derivative can help you with these four things and only these four things. If you want to find points on a graph, you use the original. If you want to figure out if the graph is increasing or decreasing, or you want to find a maximum or a minimum value, you use the first derivative. That's what it's for. Okay? Now, how does it tell us these things? How do we know when something is increasing or decreasing, or there's a maximum or minimum? Well, if we can find where the f prime is positive, that means the function is increasing. So remember, we measured slope as a, a matter of increasing or decreasing. So we just look at the slope of a line. If it's positive, that means the line is going up. If it's negative, the line is going down. If f prime is less than 0, that means decreasing. So if you want to find where a function is increasing, for example, what you do is you find the derivative. Then you set it greater than or equal to 0, and you solve for your x values. And that will tell you the intervals where it's increasing. Right? Or you can set it less than zero and solve for your x values, that will tell you the intervals where it's decreasing. As for maximums, here's where a maximum will happen. So we have a max at y equals f of a in this case. Right? So let's say my x value is a. If on the left of a, my derivative is positive, meaning I'm increasing. And on the right of A, my derivative is negative, meaning I'm decreasing. And at A itself, F is continuous, and F prime is zero or undefined. In that situation, you will have a maximum point. If you want to figure out where a maximum point is, you have to establish three basic facts. 
you can locate the point and figure out that the derivative on either side changes in this particular way. It's positive on the left and negative on the right. And at the point itself, my derivative is either zero or undefined. While the function is continuous, that point will be a maximum point. <coughs> minimum is it's, it's same idea. Uh, you just look for the opposite behavior. So we have a minimum at y equals f of a. <coughs> If to the left of A you're decreasing, so you're going down, but to the right of A you're increasing, so you're going up, and at the point A, F is continuous, and F prime is zero or undefined. The undefined situation is if we have a sharp corner. Like if there's a maximum that looks like that, technically the derivative won't exist there, but it's still the biggest point around. I want to be able to identify that as well. So that's what the derivative tells you, and that's how the derivative tells you. Okay? So if you care about what your function is doing, what outputs it's giving you, what points are on a graph, you use the original function. If you care about whether your function is increasing, decreasing, where the maximums or minimums are, use the derivative of the function, and this is how it will give you that information. So it will come down to you solving inequalities, which we covered, um, it will, and it will come down to you testing intervals, which we've also covered. That's, this is algebra. At this point, it's algebra. You just need to know the, when the calculus tells you where you should be looking, what function you should be looking at when doing this algebra. And it's probably going to squeeze in the last column down there, but let's, let's see if it works. We also saw last time we introduced the second derivative. So now here's the information that the second derivative tells you. One, it tells you about concavity. Right? There are two flavors, up or down. Right? Remember, it's up like a cup or down like a cup. <coughs> right? So this doesn't tell you about increasing or decreasing. It tells you about shape. Do you shape like a smiley face or a frowny face? And that can have various interpretations on it. It can also tell you about inflection points. There's a test called the second derivative test in which you can kind of use this to talk about maximums and minimums as well, but I'd, I'd get away from that. Um, because usually in those contexts, we already have the first derivative at our expose, disposal, and we'd already be testing these things. So I'll mention the second derivative test, but I, I don't think in practice we'll use it that much. Um, but yeah, so the second derivative tells us about concavity, right? It tells us in the following way. We know that if f pr double prime is positive, that means concave up. Up like a cup. That means you're shaped like a smiley face. If your f double prime is negative, that means concave down. Down like a frown. Or a frowny face. How do you know there's an inflection <clears throat> at y equals f of a? Well, at the point a, f is continuous. The second derivative is 0 or undefined. And f double prime changes sign. So there, there are three situations just like here. I wanted, uh, can you guys actually read that? No. So you just erase the minimum and put it there. Can, can I do that? You guys copied this already? Hopefully you copied the minimum. And hopefully you have space in your notebook to put this in. So we know it's an inflection point if these three things happen. If F is continuous at the point. F double prime is zero or undefined at the point. 
and F double prime changes sign on either side. So if it's switched from a negative to a positive or a positive to a negative, um, you get an inflection. It'll, it'll look different um, based on what the signs are, but that's how you know. But knowing this as a general idea is very, very important. We will be using this um, as time goes on. So it's knowing what each function tells you and how it tells you. So you know based on what you're looking for, um, you would know that you're looking for a certain one of these functions. There are also applications, um, we spoke about this all also, applications to motion, which you, these definitions sort of really piggyback on physics, but this guy would give you position, whereas this guy would give you velocity, whereas this guy will give you acceleration. But at the end of the day, you should know what each function does and how it tells you this information. The original function gives you points, coordinates on your function, it tells you about outputs. The derivative tells you about increasing, decreasing maximums and minimums. So if you ever want to find one of these kinds of information, you would use the first derivative. If you're after concavity or inflection points, you would use the second derivative. Do not use any of these functions to find any of the other things that's not in their row. Okay? So if you're trying to figure out when something is increasing and you use the second derivative, I'll know you have no idea what you're talking about and just mark you wrong and move on with my life. Right? If you're looking for a point on a graph and you use the first derivative, I'll know you have no idea what you're talking about. And I'll just move on with my life. Each function does a very specific thing. There's a very specific reason to use each particular function. And so with that, we kind of we end 2.4 there. So do we have both sides of the equation? So the first one is Yes. So 2.3 and 2.4 are D1 Friday. Uh, we'll now get a jump star in chapter 3. Huh? Uh, don't we have a Yeah, I'll give you a test back in here. So chapter three is really geared towards um, shortcuts, basically. Um, so basically, you don't derivatives are very important. You don't want to have to go through a limit definition every time you want to find a derivative. So we're going to derive a lot of formulas and use a lot of properties to make finding derivatives easier. And that's the that's the whole point of chapter three. So we're going to. One. We're going to talk about derivative formulas and properties. So the formulas will help us find shortcuts, um, will give us shortcuts to find derivatives for uh, very nice functions. Properties means the algebraic properties, whether derivatives distribute, how they can, how we multiply derivatives and things like that. Um, let's start out with properties. Um, so, uh, so here, C is a constant. and f prime of x and g prime of x exists. So there's one property called the constant factor property. Um, this 
is the property that says we can factor constants out of derivatives. So this is the property that says if I'm taking the derivative of a constant times a function, I can actually factor the constant out and take the derivative of the function. And all these properties work in the background because these are properties that work on limits. If I want the limit of a constant times a function, it's the same as the constant times the limit of the function. So the limit definition um, gives us the constant factor property. Um, there's also the sum and difference property. Or some people call it the sum difference rule. Um, this says if we're taking the derivative of one function plus or minus another function, it's the same as taking the derivative <coughs> of each individual function and adding them together. y equals 5x, right? How do you find y prime? Well, this would just be 5 times the derivative of x, right? So in other words, to take the derivative of 5x, I can factor that 5 off and just take, do this. We found the derivative of x in the last class. We know that that's 1. So this just becomes 5 times 1. So the derivative here is 5. That's you taking advantage of the constant uh, factor. Constants in front, they don't matter. You can just leave them alone and take the derivative of the function and then do that. Um, if your function is, if you want to find the derivative of something like x, 2x plus the square root of x, then what you do is you take the derivative of each individual. So you can take the derivative of 2x plus the derivative of absolute i of x. You can just do derivatives separately, they distribute across sums. For this one, the 2 I can factor out, and that's just me finding the derivative of x. Plus here, I have the derivative of radical x. <coughs> derivative of x we know is 1, we did that last time. Derivative of radical x, we also know, we did that last time, that's 1 over 2 radical x. So that we saw last time. That's the one. 1 over 2 radical x. So there, we can factor constants out of derivatives, and we can split them across sums. These are two important properties. from scratch in my 1207 class, but I'm not going to do it here. Um, just take it on faith at this point. One of the reasons why we like the function e to the x, and right where I was talking about how e is all important and e to the x is really nice, is because its derivative is itself. Besides the number 0, this is the only function in which its derivative is itself. Right? Well, it also implies that any constant times is it, it's going to be itself. So the derivative of this guy, e to the x is e to the x. Right? This is just, this is something you have to memorize. If you care to see why that's true, you can watch my 1207 video, but I, I don't think deriving that is very, it's going to be very insightful for this class. Um, because, um, 
Another thing that's important is called the chain rule. Again, I'm not going to prove this. There are some rules that I'm going to prove for you, but if they're kind of too subtle or too technical, I'm not going to prove it. Um, the chain rule is one of those subtle rules. Um, it's a rule that says, it t tells you how to differentiate composite functions. So if you want to differentiate a function plugged inside, a function that's a composite function, has an inside function and an outside function, so one function plugged it into another one. Um, the rule for that is to differentiate the outside function, leave the inside function alone, then multiply by the derivative of the inside function. This is a chain rule. Um, I'll give you a simple example here, but we'll do a lot more examples later on when I talk about <coughs> rules. And I think section 3.4 goes into the chain rule in detail, so we'll look at it again. Um, but that's a basic rule um, called the chain rule. Basic, probably not the word, fundamental um, rule. So, for example, if I wanted to differentiate x plus the square root of x squared. There are a couple ways I could do this. I could actually just foil it out and expand and all that stuff. Or I can use what we call the chain rule and realize that there are two functions here. There's really the square function and then there's an inside function of x plus radical x. Notice that here there's an inside function and then there's an outside function. So it's like I took x plus radical x and I plugged it into x squared. So. Basically what that says is I'm going to differentiate the outside function and multiply by the derivative of the inside function. So the outside function is differentiating x squared, right? So it's something squared. How do we, we found the derivative of x squared of as well. What was that? 2x. It was 2x. So to differentiate the outside function, I'm going to take that 2 down and put it in front. So the derivative of x squared is 2x, but because it's not just x, there's an inside function. The rule says I need to multiply by the derivative of the inside function. So I'm going to take the derivative of this inside function here and multiply by its derivative. Derivative of x we found, that's 1. Derivative of radical x we've also found, that's 1 over 2 radical x. So that's just a simple one. Um, we'll do a lot more on the chain rule coming soon. But um, but I basically want to use it to show you another important rule. Oh, are we out of time? Yes. Uh, okay. I want to end with the power rule. I'm good. Next time I'll use the chain rule to derive the power rule and then we'll really get rolling. We'll do a lot of rules all at once. <laughs> I will give you guys back your test. So yeah, starting next class, things are going to kind of start moving fast, so hopefully you <laughs> got your bearings on you. Um, once we learn the shortcut formulas, we'll be able to do a lot in a very little time.